thank you so much for being with us, Matthias. I'm really glad to have you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited. So yeah, I'm glad that I can be here. So thanks for the invitation. And that's your first podcast, right? You've never been. It on is a my first one. Yeah, um, okay. that's true. But I mean, you have done a lot of presentations before. Um, it's just like you haven't been on a podcast. Yeah, sure. Like as a PhD student, uh, you travel a lot and not in recent times, but you give a lot of presentations about your papers and, and stuff like that. Um, but um, never have a recorded discussion about graph representation learning in general. All right, that must be fun. Um, let's talk about what you're known best for, which is the pipe course geometric. Um, you're the founder and core maintainer for um, the um, library. And I guess it started with your April 28th and 2019 paper with fast graph representation learning with pipe course geometric, if I'm not um, incorrect. Uh, tell me, how did you get the inspiration for that? Um, and uh, is your research similar to a graph learning or um, tell us about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so actually that was kind of incorrect because it started with my first paper that I wrote um, when I just um, applied to the PhD program and that was in end of um, 2017. And so the PyG the paper came out uh, one in the year, uh, one year and a half later. So I took my time. <laughs> Um, and the motivation for that was that I basically wanted to have a, um, a unified framework for my own research. Um, so as a, as a researcher um, in, in graph representation learning, um, you don't want to rewrite everything from scratch for a single project. And that was kind of the, the motivation for myself to make that um, as unified and as, as general as possible right from the beginning. Um, and then it turned out that it cannot uh, like accel accelerate my own research, but also the, the research of others. And so I open sourced it immediately. Um, and yeah, then it became luckily kind of really, really popular. And it's great to see all the community efforts and contributors to, uh, to make that project so great as it is right now. And one of the good parts of um, PyTorch Geometric is that it's very seamless. And if you're already familiar with PyTorch, you can, um, you know, write a couple of lines of code and, you know, use the graphical library for that. Uh, we'll get to the integration of how these two works hand in hand. But let's talk about the core um, departure of graphical neural networks from the conventional neural network like um, CNNs or RNNs or transformers. What is the core difference between um, these two and how does um, graphical neural network um, actually improve on what's already there? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question because like I feel that most of these um, deep learning architectures can be transferred to one or the other. Um, and for, for graph neural networks, it's actually the case that it's a more general class of neural networks that basically combines all these um, all these dedicated tools that we have to work on different domains into a, a general class of, of neural network architectures. And so, for example, you can interpret graph neural networks as transformer models. You can also interpret them as convolutional neural networks. And to some extent, you can also interpret them as recurrent neural networks. And the beauty of that is that graph neural networks basically combine all these fields in, into a single tool um, to operate or to allow uh, operating on, on such, such data as well as on, on more irregular structured data such as graphs. Uh, I can I can go into more details if if you want. Um, sure, exactly. I mean, what the interesting part of that, if, for example, let's take a picture, um, an, an image that you generally put into a CNN to find out if that's a cat or a dog. When it comes to graph neural networks, I've seen some of your presentations, um, and it seems like instead of um, you know convolving a filter on that image um, and then pulling it, what graph neural network does is that you know it represents the whole image um, in a graphical format that is connected to each other. And so instead of um, connecting all layers like a dense layer so it's sort of a neighbor a neighborhood um, map of the whole image so let's go a little bit deep into the architecture of how um, it's different from the conventional um, connected layers in a convolution neural network um, and how it's different in the graphical neural network 
Sure. So if you if you think of like a regular um, deep neural network represented as an SM as an MLP, uh, which you just have a stack of, of fully connected layers that kind of learns nonlinear functions. And then you can think of that if you if you do that batch wise that you apply the same transformation to all examples. And each example in which you operate is kind of independent of each other. And graph neural networks try to, to modify that to some extent in which you can now have examples or nodes in your graph um, that transform their features based on their features um, they carry with, uh, with itself, but also, the, also the, the features of other examples that are kind of related or connected to these nodes. And that is some kind of similar to what we do in CNNs as well. Uh, in which you have a filter that slides over over the image, um, and each each window in that image is is kind of transformed um, um, the same, um, and it's able to detect like really important features that might be relevant for the downstream task. And so for graph neural networks, um, it's actually the same, just that we don't have a fixed structure, a fixed window, uh, but that window um, is now like dynamic dependent on the number of relations a node has um, and the number of, of um, like the number of different edge types and stuff like that. And so um, CNNs or graph neural networks can be viewed as a variant of CNNs that can not only work on, on fixed grid structure like structures, um, but can also operate on arbitrary structures. Okay. And it's a very interesting uh, departure here because um, I was on an expert panel um, on a startup um, like three months ago. It was an IIT-based um, Indian startup, which was trying to get some information about um, the pricing model for um, an idea that there has to be an AI-generated image in which you know people will simply write um, text-based description of what they want, and AI would create an image um, out of their textual descriptions. Um, I, presumably, they have trained model um, on a lot of images of different kinds. And then when different text um, descriptions of those uh, images are there, so they simply combine it together. And I was just wondering, graphical neural network can probably be used um, in, in a cer certain way that maximizes scales, um, up or scales down um, the neighborhood structure um, or a grid-like structure in different images that can be expanded. Um, and I was just wondering, do you can you think of uh, um, an application of graphical neural networks that would be able to combine different images into um, a text-based input-output um, structure um, that can be made out of that? I'm not yeah, sure if I've explained good... it correctly, but you know, uh, I don't know. Just ask me if you don't understand that. Yeah, I'm. I'm just going ahead, and please correct me if I understood it uh, wrongly. Um, so if you if you think of of images, um, and you want to, like, obtain a textual representation of that image, then graph neural networks are kind of the best fit you can have for that because it allows you to infer like compositional um, information. Uh, as well as relational information from that image and use that to generate text. And that in some sense, they, they combine these little programs that we have, like an object detection from a CNN and a text generator using a transformer network or recurrent neural network. And the, these programs are kind of combined using graph neural networks. So you can think of um, the CNN detects like bounding boxes of, of, uh, of important objects in your image and gives you some kind of important image features of these objects. And then you can um, create a graph out of these bounding boxes and objects and you can automatically infer how these objects relate to each other. And that helps you or should help you tremendously in, in generating a better text representation out of that. Is that uh, like uh, I understood the question correctly? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I think one of the variations um, that I can think of is, and that's one of the biggest problems um, in um, image classification, that the 
for example, if you were to um, do the data augmentation for an image classification problem, so if you have a dog, you know, you, you turn it upside down and you turn it um, horizontally on the right or the left, um, then you tr give more uh, samples to the uh, to the architecture so that you know classification becomes easy. And it's my understanding, and today I'm going to make a fool out of myself because I don't understand graphical network as much as you do, but you know, as long as I learn, it's fine. So if you were to data augment a data set, um, how would graph graphical neural networks um how is it going to actually be able to classify that because um from for i for what i understand is that it's a grid based um um you know and it, it interprets the image um, based on a grid so if there is a there is a compositional change in an image what how would they technically approach that problem I mean, like if you if you augment the image, um, then it just stays in a in a grid like structure as well. Um, yeah. So, so let's say also... if you have a three columns, let's divide an image into three columns, and dog is in the center column. But then you do the dot data augmentation, and then it becomes on the right um, column or the left column or the top side or the um, top left or right. So is it is graph neural network going to um, you know see the um, dog and the um, environment? correlation based on the nodes um, or the pixels or is it going to actually identify the dog from the image I mean, how does it going to work so first of all like a convolutional neural network should detect like um, the same dog or the same object in an image independent of where it is in the image because inherently it is trans designed to be translation invariant that means that we um, can can move our objects around and the detecting features are still there present in your image. And so if you if you now detect these image uh, these bounding boxes uh, and they might be augment or like they might be applied some augmentation where you shift the dog around in your image, then that changes your graph as well. And the, um, if you if you think of each bounding box as a node and you now connect, all the bounding boxes to infer relations of them, then that changes, of course, also the predictions made by the graph neural network where um, things are in your image and how they relate to each other. And you can think of like having a, um, an image where you see a bike and a person. And so the meaning changes of how these objects relate to each other depending on how they were, how they are in the, in the image. And if the, if the person stands next to a bike, um, then that is a different meaning than a person that currently drives a bike, right? I think it's understandable. Um, let's put it in another way, which is that um, if you were to use some other example, for example, the, the audio example, it flattens on the um, audio and you know, checks the prosody levels um, and the different uh, voice levels um, within the audio. If you were to introduce noise um, to that um, signal, how is that going to actually perform in terms of accuracy um, in comparison with the other models like transformers or let's say RNs? Um, how does it actually do that? I'm trying to technically understand that what's the, um, what's the edge for the GNNs over um, the other models that we are already familiar with? Yeah, there might be some misunderstanding because I said that GNNs um, can model all these classes of neural networks that we already have. Um, but they are also, if you do that, they inherit their, their weaknesses. Like if you, um, you can, you can of course, like um, interpret a graph neural network as a transformer network in which you have a fully connected graph and you compare um, or you compute node, node wise or pair wise attention scores to each node in the graph. Um, that is basically a transformer model. Um, and it helps you to detect important uh, feature or important nodes in your complete graph. And you can model that using a graph neural network when using the fully connected graph. Um, in, a, in a CNN, it is equally um, in which you now operate on, on grid-like structures instead of arbitrary structures. And if you think of recurrent neural networks, um, you, can, you can think of that as like, um, iteratively aggregating diff from different neighbors. So in the first step, you, um, you um, 
in the first step, you aggregate from the direct neighbor, so the previous word, for example, and in the ne next step, you aggregate from the word before that previous word. And so that can all be modeled by a graph neural network. And the gain you now have is that you have a, a, a general applicable class of graph neural networks that can be also applied to different domains as well. And in particular in domains where you don't can represent data as a regular data structure. And that kind of applies to a lot of domains we know about, such as in social networks, in in chemistry where you want to operate on molecular graphs and stuff like that. And it is also applies in computer vision where you want to operate on point clouds or geometry. And that is all, these are all kind of things that you cannot represent as a regular data structure. And you cannot simply apply transformer networks to that or convolutional neural networks to that. And that makes it so interesting that we now have an architecture that can be applied to any domain and it can either represent the architectures that we have, um, but it also is much more powerful in that it can be applied to different domains as well, in which our classical toolbox cannot be applied. And do we have any studies um, or papers um, that would um, give us the benchmarks um, and the metrics for the accuracy for both of them? Um, or you know even the computational uh, superiority of JNNs um, over the other ones. I mean, if you if you're operating on an image like data, then it's always the best choice to use a CNN. Uh, it's just interesting that there are connections to graph neural networks, and that graph neural networks basically um, can interpret uh, or can be modeled as as convolutional neural networks. But if you think of like fully connected graphs, then it doesn't make much sense from a computational point of perspective or from a memory consumption point of perspective to um, to let a graph neural network run over this um, because graph neural networks are basically designed to operate on sparse data we just have like limited connections or a limited number of neighbors for each node um, and they are not really designed to operate on, on dense structures in which you basically have connections to all other nodes or neurons in your, um, in your data. And um, so from a, from a computational point of perspective, it's always better to have like dedicated implementations for that. Um, it's just interesting that there is a connection. And if you want to um, learn on ir irregular structured data, then there's no way around graph neural networks. Very interesting. It brings me to the point that, you know, I was um, talking to NK Jain, who is the um, MLNAI leader um, at Facebook um, last time on my podcast. And we uh, came to talk about um, PyG uh, 2.0, and uh, they do a lot of work with graph um, neural networks um, at Facebook. And he was talking to me that um, it becomes a huge problem uh, implementing it when you have around 100 million rows. It takes about a week um, to actually you know, run the job. Um, and I'm just wondering, what is the um, time and space complexity um, for the graph neural networks in comparison to um, others? And what would be um, an ideal situation to actually use that and other situations where it might be avoided? Because you know, I was thinking about the architecture, especially I read about your um, presentation that you um, gave, um, I think it's um, in the biomedical something conference, um, and you talk about the messaging between different nodes um, and you and, and the and consistent updating of edges, and that at some point, if you have hundred million rows, that becomes a huge pro a huge problem, and I'm just wondering how how does it actually translate into performance? Um, you also wrote a paper called uh, GNN Auto Scale, um, where you talk about um, the scaling of um, your um, architecture. Let's let's explore this a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so the computational complexity of applying graph neural networks basically depends on the number of edges you have in your graph. Um, so just to formalize graph neural networks for now, um, what they do is they, they follow a message passing scheme. That means that each neighbor of a particular node crafts a message that depends on its features and potentially existing edge features. And those, 
these, these messages from neighbors are then sent to the root node and are then aggregated to like enhance the current node representation of that particular node. And so we see that um, we have a computation that depends on the number of edges in your, in your graph because like each edge will send a message to, um, to a node that is then aggregated. And so for a comp computational complexity, we are now dependent on the number of edges. Um, and for, um, for memory uh, complexity, that depends on how you define your GNN operator. So there can be some GNN operators that do not need to necessarily materialize these message, um, message representations, but can directly aggregate from, from, from the direct neighborhood. And so memory complexity can be uh, independent on the number of nodes, or it can be dependent on the number of edges. But in both cases, if you think of like massive large scale graphs and 100 million nodes is large, but I heard of, of even some bigger um, networks, um, then this becomes like totally inefficient to train, right? Um, in particular, because like, in, in CNNs and transformer networks, we apply that notion of stochastic gradient descent where we just optimize on the mini batch of examples. And if you want to apply that to graph neural networks, it's not exactly clear what that means. And so in the beginning of graph representation learning research, like everyone um, trained um, graph neural networks in full batch mode. And that means that you um, optimize all nodes in the graph um, simultaneously. Um, and if you think of applying full batch GNNs to large scale graphs, that obviously fails because now you need to compute the node embeddings for 100 million nodes and then compute the uh, gradients um, for the model parameters based on all of these 100 million nodes, right? Um, and that becomes like totally inefficient to train. And it also becomes really slow to to optimize um, because now you only have one optimization step per uh, forward pass. And that forward pass might take ages to, um, to run. And so one, one way to, to think about that is to bring like mini batch training to large scale graphs. And that means that we only operate on the mini batch of nodes for which we compute embeddings and then we um, optimize the model parameters only based on these current nodes in our mini batch. So that sounds really easy to do, um, but if you think about that, it becomes um, like really problematic in a graph scenario um, because each node in the mini batch depends on um, the representations of the neighbors. Uh, and if you apply GNN iteratively, um, it actually depends on the K hop neighborhood of each node and where K, K is the number of layers you apply to your GNN. And if you think of like applying really deep GNNs, then, get, then this can get like um, really worse in performance and it can even lead to like needing to aggregate from, the, uh, from nodes in your complete graph, uh, which kind of contradicts with the initial idea of applying efficient mini batch training. And so over time, there were some, uh, there were a lot of research regarding this topic. And this uh, comes down to proposing different scalability techniques to apply mini batch training to GNNs. And so one way to do that is for example, neighborhood sampling in which you just sample a number of nodes uh, per iteration. So each, each node may just like, um, now relate to five neighbors or 10 neighbors instead of the complete neighborhood. Um, but you still get that notion of recursive neighborhood explosions there. And another approach here is, uh, for example, subgraph sampling in which you find uh, a set of mini batch nodes that might be highly connected to each other. And then you just perform message passing on these on this set of mini batch nodes. But overall, that's a really interesting research area. Um, but I feel that we haven't yet found the best method to do like mini batch training on, on really large graphs. 
Um, let's look at some of the guidelines on um, the Open Graph Benchmark um, um, page. Um, you are collaborating with Yor um, uh, Leskovich, um, brilliant professor at Stanford, uh, in maintaining those data sets. Um, and the guideline says that you know if you have a um, hundred k um, nodes um, set, um, then you know you could probably use um, a single GPU, um, and then if it goes to one million, probably then you have to uh, you know, try adding GPU. Then at hundred million, it becomes extremely complicated. So, like you said yourself, you know the level of abstraction um, adds to the complexity. Uh, for example, node to node is one section um, that you could do a mini batch, and then one node to another neighbor that's another section, and then one whole cluster to another whole cluster that becomes a huge um, you know problem that adds to the complexity. And I was just wondering in, in a in a very large um, data set, for example, let's say real time computer vision or any um, streaming data that will become a huge problem um, in terms of uh, not only calculation, but also in terms of, um, you know, gaining insights from them. Um, and, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, how to actually make it more plausible um, in large scale systems uh, where you don't have to worry about these complexities? Um, yes, so I'm, I'm not sure what you mean with don't worry about complexities, but I think you, you always no, I'm need asking to worry you about know, complexities. But do, do you know that, um, for example, let's put that in perspective. So if you, if you were to use um, um, Tesla information and put that to a GNN instead of your, uh, their own um, CNN systems, but, you know, the, the complexity in my understanding would really increase that would probably be out of hand. Um, so what steps can we actually take to make sure that, you know, the GNNs are able to handle that um, magnitude of data as well? I mean, the the only two options that you have here is kind of like distribute your data or apply um, scalability techniques to sample mini batches. Um, and for yeah, distributed data, we might talk later about that. But um, to finish my my uh, my um, my comment regarding scalability, um, in in OGB we we have that measure of one like one hundred k is a small scale graph, and one million might be a graph that is kind of like you can train it on a single GPU, but you might need some scalability techniques. And if you go to around like 100 million nodes, then you even might want to use like multiple GPUs. And those are just some some measures that we that we found are uh, applicable in case of applying graph neural networks. So the the um, the bar that you apply like full batch training ends around like 100k nodes. It might be able to to also train on 200k nodes in full batch fashion, but that also depends on the number of layers in your graph and stuff like that, and the number of feature dimensionalities, of course. Um, and for like 1 million node graphs, you can easily train that on a single GPU and it will also train really fast, um, like in, in one hour or even less. Um, but you kind of need scalability techniques to fit all these node features that are in your computation graph into GPU memory. And the deciding limitation is here, the GPU memory. And a custom G GPU that I can afford takes around 11 G uh, gigabyte. Um, I'm aware that some people have access to, to much better GPUs um, with much more GPU memory. And then you might even uh, be able to train like 1 million um, node graphs on a single GPU without full batch training, uh, with full batch training, sorry. Um, but the general user needs to apply some scalability techniques here. And the next step towards training, like even on bigger data is use multi GPUs to like um, better optimize um, the network so that it had access to a wider range of node features. And then the next step basically becomes if you think of scales like 1 billion, um, how can we um, efficiently distribute the data? But since then you might not be able to load the data in full memory and you need to uh, find some ways to make that work um, in, in a distributed data, uh, data scenario. Okay, let's shift from what um, are the problems um, or let's say future research areas to what it has already done. You know, it's become hugely um, popular among a lot of um, deep learning researchers, uh, 700 plus research papers that use uh, graphical neural networks, um, especially um, um, 
hydrometric library. Um, it has also collaborated with um, OGB, the Open Graph um, benchmark, um, and it has data sets which are large scale, encompass multiple important graph ML tasks, and cover a diverse range of domains uh, ranging from social and information networks to biological networks, molecular graphs, source code, ASC, and knowledge graphs. Uh, just wondering, uh, what are some of the real um, life data sets um, that you have seen in the research um, that um, hydrometric has been used on? And um, you have, I'm sure you have talked with these people who are using it in real life. What, what was the feedback like? Um, yeah, I, I know a lot of people um, who actually use PyG also in production. Um, most of them work on on um, biological task or, or task from from chemistry, like learning on molecular graphs and making predictions of um, of like how a molecule um, um, like which are important properties of a given molecule that is not known to us yet, um, and that helps tremendously in in tasks such as drug discovery. There are a lot of users in in PyG that apply like um, graph neural networks to, to point cloud data, uh, which is especially important in, in autonomous driving, for example, uh, where you get a constant stream of, of lighter data coming in and you want to process that um, in an efficient manner. Um, I'm aware of that Tesla is doing that purely uh, image-based, but there's still a lot of research regarding um, you doing that in the, in the point cloud scenario. Um, and then you, you have a lot of applications in recommendation. And recommendation is kind of a task which I feel um, graph neural network doesn't have the biggest impact yet, um, but in my opinion, it has the potential for it. Um, and in particular, um, if you think of like user products graphs, like um, a user buys a specific product and you want to infer whether another user also wants to buy that product as well. And if you think of that problem purely in a matrix factorization fashion, where you just learn embeddings of nodes and of, of, of user nodes and product nodes, and these matrix factorization algorithm actually fails in, um, in, in, in capturing longer range dependencies like whether a specific user knows another user um, and which users buy the same product as another user and stuff like that. And I think there is a lot of potential regarding GNNs in, in this regard, because it, it can basically infer all these relations from scratch. But I think we, we haven't seen the success in there yet. I think it was an interesting point that you brought up. And I guess we talked about that earlier also, how Spotify uh, solved the cold start problem um by matching the user and the product um information of a product that's just coming into the store and that's not already there so there is no recommender system that's already recommending um that product how would do you think um, technically graph graphical neural networks would solve this um, problem i personally think that there is a huge room for recommendation system improvement based on gnn but i just don't know how to implement that yeah that's an interesting topic uh, like making recommendations for products that no one has bought yet for example um yeah that's that's really really interesting I haven't thought about that yet but um i feel like graph neural networks are a good use case for that in particular if you um say goodbye to like learning embeddings for each product and each user you have in your graph because that makes kind of the the learning scenario um not being applied to to unseen nodes, right? And if you think of some some crucial feature representations of of products, um, for example, for Spotify, it would be like uh, em embed the song using an, an audio encoder or stuff like that. And then you can um, basically infer um, recommendations with the graph neural networks just based on these features and not based on on some kind of learned embeddings attached to these. Um, to these products and or songs. But, yeah, yeah, in, in, in some sense, you, you need some kind of initial feature representation in order to do that in an inductive 
learning scenario? Yeah, I think it depends really on um, the mode that you're using also. Uh, for example, audio data is probably a little easier to, you know, uh, find out, vectorize the sound bit and then, you know, match it with all the other sound bits that a per particular customer has listened to and then, you know, match it. So that's kind of an easy way to fix the cold uh, start problem in audio. But I was just wondering in other modes, how did it work, for example, and the image data or the textual data or the um, number data? Um, can you think of some of a way? Yeah, I mean, like for audio is, is really similar in that regard to image data or um, text data, because we have like these, these dedicated solutions to embed them efficiently by now. And that is via ResNet pre-trained on ImageNet, for example, or you can use a transformer network that is pre-trained and just Im embeds your sentences um, into a low dimensional embedding vector. Um, it gets a little bit tricky on how you um, decode other types of data. Um, if you just want to decode like floating point data, you can simply write it into your feature matrix. If you have some kind of categorical values, um, you can use one hot embeddings for this um, to encode this. And all of these things basically then get merged into a single unified feature matrix, then uh, which can then be used to um, propagate messages between these nodes based on the given features in your graph neural network. But yeah, um, encoding um, or efficient encoding of, of features um, isn't something we do in research generally because we are given pre benchmark data sets and all these features are given by us and nobody cares about like how, how were they generated. So that is really an advantage of doing um, research in graph ne uh, neural networks. Um, but is that it's basically in, in industry, it's like the, the main task you have to solve. Okay. And feature encoding is, is really, really difficult and uh, it also depends on, um, like, if you if you want to test your feature encoder, you can you can test it by directly using an MLP um, and decide on which features work best. But it's also questionable if those feature um, you choose also apply to a graph neural network because some features might get ir ir um, irrelevant if you if you think of applying graph neural networks to them because they might get like automatically inferred by just passing messages and other features might be important um, the, um, if you want to aggregate messages, uh, which might not be important if you just um, uh, look at, at all these features in isolation. I was just wondering, maybe the cold um, start problem um, in the vision domain, for example, let's talk in concrete terms. So if you want to buy a shoe and there's a new category of shoes coming in into a store, which it doesn't, it didn't really have already, um, then what you can probably do is that instead of focusing on um, a smart way of um, using an algorithm to do that, you can probably use the behavioral and scientific um, principles on, you know, what category would be more interested in that. So for example, it's um, it's a male shoe, then you know, automatically all other categories is going to be uh, ruled out. And then also what age um, the shoes are for, like are they formal, are they um, jogging shoes, um, are they running shoes, um, are they Crocs and things like this. So that would probably make the problem a little bit easier. But then again, we're talking about um, the algorithmic solution for that. But let's take a break from the um, algorithm talk and uh, talk about um, your football journey. You are part of a league. <laughs> Um, in Germany and you know Germans take their football very seriously tell us a little about that yeah that's true like we're we're German uh, people are living for for football or soccer or whatever <laughs> so every Saturday is uh, reverse uh, reserved for for football of course um, I'm playing football uh, football for myself since I'm like I was the age of, of four or five <laughs> um uh, I had a few pauses in between or breaks, um, but yeah, never could let go of it. Even if I browse now more, more GitHub than and then playing soccer, um, and yeah, but it but it's just more of a hobby for myself. So uh, I'm playing in the worst possible league uh, uh, that you can imagine, um, but it's still kind of um, competitive if you think about that in in that regard. It's not like we're 
we are all doing dumb stuff during a game um but it's definitely fun and helps me to um to like get a break from from thinking about graph neural networks so how do you rank your league um or your team in the whole league oh we're we're currently placed first so pretty good <laughs> <laughs> why would you call it a worst team then <laughs> Yeah, it's the worst league, uh, but we're currently the best team in the worst league. <laughs> ah, well, at least there's a silver lining there. I mean, I would have loved to continue playing football also, just but I broke my ACL playing football, so that was enough of a le lesson. I don't know, have you ever been, um, you know, did you wrench your um, ankle or something playing football? Yeah, sure. Uh, that I, I think that, that happens to all of us uh, sometime if we do some sport, but I... I always recovered after breaks, so um, nothing, nothing dramatic happened to me yet. Luckily. Yeah, because I don't know. I think ACL is kind of um, the hard one to reconstruct, and you have to take and do the grafting. You know, take out a tendon from somewhere else, and you know, reconstruct it. And you know, it takes a lot of um, time to um, do that. Um, have you ever broken? Have you ever broken your ACL? Also, no, I, or I, just I like... never, never uh, have broken anything. So, <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Who do you predict is going to win the next league? Like the best league, not the you worst. You mean the, <laughs> the Bundesliga? Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm. I'm guess that's that's on 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 Bayern run once again. It's always Bayern. Uh, you know, there's no. It's always Bayern, but yeah. Hopefully, we see some um, some variations there soon. Um, but yeah, my my um, preferred uh, team is called Schalke, um, and they just got relegated to the second league. So. Um, Okay, the things are not going very well on the football side. Well, let's get back exactly. to that. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but we're first place, don't forget. <laughs> well, that's always a silver lining. Um, let's get back to the algorithmic side. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, PyTorch um, geometric, um, and we also talked about um, graph graphical neural networks in general. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, how it can be really applied into industry uh, if there is a practical usage for that. And you, you talked about um, some of the uh, people who are actually using it in production. Um, and it certainly has a hope, in, um, depending on the um, iClear publications every year. 2018, it's um, more and more papers every year. Um, and I think it's around 800 for 2020. And uh, I don't know, uh, are there any papers in your IPS recently um, that use a graph and uh, like or PyTech geometric? Do you know them? Oh, I, I don't know if they are using uh, PyG in, in particular. I, I, I think so. At least a few will be there. Um, um, but yeah, of course, like graph representation learning research hasn't stopped yet. Um, we see um, a lot of uh, improvements regarding specific tasks in, in particular. I feel like um, the in the last few years, a lot of research in GNNs was around like uh, inventing a new operator that beats all the other operators. Um, but we kind of shifted um, towards like a much broader research area in which we see applications to GNNs in, in all kinds of different domains. And that is really amazing to see. Like we see applications in NLP and computer vision um, and stuff like that. Interesting. So let's um, in Stanford Computing Workshop. Um, um, so uh, it's very interesting that you know the the adoption is throughout the industry in different uh, fields. So let's talk a, a little bit about some of the uh, poster workshop from the industry um, in the recent Stanford Computing Workshop um, that you give presentation and um, you was a part of it. Um, and they talked about different applications in financial industry, in network intrusion, um, in um, social network monitoring. Um, anomaly detection, and which of them all do you think um, has um, the highest chance of um, actually um, adopting graphical networks on a permanent basis in a production environment, and you know, so that it actually outperforms most of the architectures um, that, that that are already being used? Oh, that's that's really hard for me to see uh, to say, to be honest, um, because I'm not yet uh, into um, those all these kinds of different domains. Um, um, I guess we will see a lot of impact in financial networks and in, in social networks uh, and in, in like learning on molecular graphs, uh, which has already started a real revolution. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to make a, a certain prediction, um, but 
um, to be honest, like in, in all of these domains, graph neural networks have the potential to, um, to make a huge impact. Um, in particular, if you think of like, um, if you think of like, um, what are the alternatives that we can apply? Um, um, and in some sense, we're just limited by, um, by computational and costs and, and how we can apply graph neural networks in production rather than um, is that the right method to do all of that? Because I'm, I'm certain that it is. Um, because if you, if you think of related methods like graph kernels or node embedding techniques that exist um, you can all do that in, in graph neural networks in a much more flexible way uh, and in a much more efficient way in which you don't have to care about any feature engineering and stuff like that. Okay. And one of the things, let's move from industry to the, to the individual. Uh, one of the things that um, has posed challenge for a lot of um, citizen data scientists um, in adoption of graphical network networks is the uh, transformation of raw data into and graphical format. Um, and that has been, some, you know, some of the challenges that has kept a lot of people uh, from trying um, the the library itself. Uh, there are other software, which, you, which are GUI based softwares like in Gephi, um, that you can import your data into and you know, that's going to create um, the node embeddings, and then you know, and display the network diagrams for that and people generally copy paste it um, in their um, research and wherever they have to present it. Um, as for now, there is no um, internal um, translator from the raw data into graphical um, net, uh, format in PyG, but you talked about that that's in the pipeline. That Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, how is that going to um, work? And um... Yeah, uh, let me first start that this kind of contradicts the, the vision of representer, representation learning uh, kind of a bit, because like if you apply deep learning, then you're kind of expected to work on, on the raw data, right? You don't have to do any feature engineering in, in processing text and you don't have to do any feature engineering in processing images. You just put your raw image into a CNN and then that works out of the box. And so um, this kind of contradicts with the view of graph neural networks in which you say like, you want to learn representations from the raw data, but it's actually unsure what raw data really is um, because it, in, in graphs, it can, it can have all kinds of forms, right? Um, you can think of nodes having features such as text. Um, it can have features such as float, uh, categorical values, even images or audio. And this multi-model feature um, uh, feature uh, features that you have make it kind of difficult to automatically process that. And currently in PyG, um, so PyG is is currently more viewed as a deep learning framework. So it is expected that the user um, takes care of implementing the graph data by itself, and then PyG takes care. Um, of just processing that with a graph neural network, right? Similar to um, what PyTorch or Torch Vision is, is doing in their libraries. Um, and as I said, it's, it's much more complicated in graph neural networks. And I feel um, that we need to provide way better support in PyG to make that uh, the application of graph neural networks as, as easy as possible. And yeah, I, I have a few uh, few thoughts about like how um, how do we can automatically infer feature matrices from uh, from a given set of features um, or a given set of raw features, um, but it's it's really really challenging to implement. But that is something that I really love to bring to to PyG as well, so that it's really convenient for the industry to just plug and play a graph neural network, and then it takes care of creating feature matrices and the graph structure out of out of uh, out of nothing basically i mean one of the ways possibly could be that you know you could create a notebook with um you know out of the box and um, templates for um, let's say um, image um, classification um, problem and then you know all the user has to do is that you know, go to the folder and put their own images instead of the images already there and you know everything 
rest of the thing is done because I'm thinking on from the perspective of not a researcher like you who actually know deeply about um, the tool and you know how to modify these things to some kind of data manipulation but from the perspective of a, a citizen data scientist which is um, someone who simply wants to do analytics and does not have deep knowledge of um, algorithms or let's even say Python or R and things like this and they yep. just want to have some find some kind of correlations within their data um, that might exist there um, and that's something that would bring a lot of people to the fold of um, PyTorch Geometric who otherwise are very intimidated by the fact that you know how they have to actually convert their data first into an acceptable form and then learn all the syntax. Um, so do you think that might be a quick solution to you know simply give them um, quick start notebooks? Yeah, we, we, well, I, first of all, I totally agree with your viewpoint. Um, like creating graphs um, currently is a major limitation to, to make PyG more applicable to industry. Um, the, the challenging aspect is really that there are multiple ways how you can potentially encode a feature and it's not exactly clear what's the best way. Um, so just to give you an example, like for, for temporal or timestamps, there exist multiple methods how you can encode that. And they also depend on like how, um, how is your timestamp really, um, really encoded. And that seems quite complicated to automatically infer. Um, another thing is if you have categorical values, so each, each value re represents a category, um, then you want to maybe potentially um, use different encoders to, to embed those. For example, if you have a lot of categories in your, in your column, in your feature column, then it might not be even beneficial to encode that as a one-hot matrix because like you get a huge amount of parameters introduced there. And instead it might be more official to embed them uh, as part of the deep learning pipeline. And so all these points make it really challenging to um, like provide an auto ML system that automatically generates your graph. Um, but it's something that I'm really interested in about. And the first step of course could be that we give clear guidelines on how one can encode like tabular data um, into a graph format that is applicable for graph representation learning. I totally agree. And that yeah, that it's it's we we have a first tutorial in our documentation that goes through that, but uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it should give you a first step towards implementing that on your own. And we want to also provide that functionality as part of PyG in later releases. You know, let, let's talk about. Um... A um, similar AutoML solution is called PyCarrot. You know, I've been working with a lot of uh, their documentation. So what you do is that you add your data set and, you know, it um, gives you s some options and that you can simply add uh, within the uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, cell. And then you can um, select the kind of machine learning model you want. What are the matrices? Um, how do you want to be displayed? All, all these things. And I was just wondering if that's something um, that you could add some kind of um, you know, an easy wizard uh, for the new users where they could set some parameters. You were talking about different ways of encoding um, those uh, features. You can give them a choice of selecting one of those. So you can make a simple template um, and then you can write the documentation. So there are different options of encoders. Which one would you like to use? And then, you know, um, which kind of data uses what kind of um, features? What are the examples? So if that encoding is already there, then, you know, it's easier for them to, you know, get started and, you know, automatically transform their data into a usable format. And then rest of the um, architecture is going to define how they want to play with um, their information. So what the purpose is to make it a more um, easy for people to, and I think it's kind of a hard thing to understand from a developing perspective. No, no, I, I very... totally understand. I'm, I was just never, uh, uh, like, I'm not, I'm not a GUI person. So yeah, I'm just I understand. Coding Mo most in, engineers in, are not. <laughs> most engineers in, are in not. Vim and, and run in a terminal. Um, but I definitely understand that such a user interface can help dramatically in, in like giving direct feedback of what encoders are available for that specific column, stuff like that. Just click and 
it will automatically do that. It's just that, yeah, currently or in the last few years, PyG was kind of a one-man project. I'm really glad that we now have a bigger team around the future development. Um, and so hopefully we have the, the power to bring all of that into later releases. And it's, it's, and it's like not only related to feature engineering, but you can also extend that to like, give me this graph neural network model and, and it should also provide an option for um, um, which is the best model for the given task, such as you can click and, and say like, this is a link prediction test. So you should use this model or that model, or that is a node classification test. You can use that model. And that would be kind of amazing to have, but yeah, it's not ye there yet. I'm really sorry. Um, but I definitely wrote that down and we'll try to integrate that. I think that might not be very hard because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are tools like uh, Mito. Um, it's a tool that you can use in Python to actually um, do the data cleaning within the cell. Um, so in kind of an Excel uh, format um, that opens within the cell and you can manipulate the data and then you can save it and then you use it for um, the data analysis um, and you're applying machine learning algorithms or neural networks on that. I mean, the, the question is like, how does it scale to like 100 million rows or uh, nodes and stuff like that? Yeah, but I guess the um, kind of people that we're talking about, that scalability is not a problem for them. So citizen data okay. scientists <laughs> might have, you know, some kind of at max 100,000 rows or um, a thousand, 10,000 rules. So I think the incentive is to give them something to start with. So instead of, you know, became, you know becoming too intimidated by the prospect of, you know, getting into a deep neural networks and learning a new tool and then modifying the whole data sets to a new format, that would be a good start for them. Uh, speaking of auto ML, have you always, um, have, at, at any point, have you thought that, you know, you could use a GUI version of that also? Um, and, you know, while you're at it, you'll talk a little bit about uh, when it's coming for TensorFlow. You mean 5G for TensorFlow? Um, yeah, let's talk, first talk about all. I guess when, you, when um, you're going to translate that into TensorFlow, it's going, going to be called TaiG. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> it, it probably still uh, remains to name PyG because Pi doesn't include the PyTorch. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, we will we will see. Um, so first off, of AutoML, um, um, what was the question? Like a, a GUI for, for AutoML, right? Um, a GUI for AutoML for <laughs> PyTorch <Pytogeometric>. metric. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, that would come if we if we have a GUI for a feature engineering. That would be definitely a part of that. Uh, I can't promise anything yet that it will be released in like a month from now, um, but. I have definitely plans to bring PyG closer to industry and make it more um, applicable there. And so that is definitely on the roadmap. And like you, you can think of AutoML in, in two ways, for example, uh, in particular. Um, the first way would be just like, give me the best hyperparameters for the given model. Um, but it can also mean something else in that sense that give me the best scalability approach for the given task or give me the correct metric to, uh, for this given task. And if, if you combine these two things together in a, in a library for graph neural networks, then that might be really something big um, that att attracts a lot of attention, I agree. Okay, um, fair enough. Um, I guess there is some hope for uh, you know, people who really want to get um, into that, um, but let's talk about um, one of the biggest issues um, in AI, um, which has um, gotten a lot of companies into trouble um, recently, it's Facebook uh, about the nature of its algorithms that cannot be explained. So explainability is something that's at the core of um, a lot of um, research um, at the moment. Um, and I was just wondering how does um, it apply into um, graph networks and, you know, the um, algorithms that you have in um, PyTorch metric? Yeah, so luckily um, we see more and more research regarding explainability in general, as well as explainability in graph neural networks. And as in overall, all these methods are kind of exchangeable, meaning that um, if you have a new explainability algorithm that works well on images, 
um, it can be potentially applied to graph neural networks as well. And so, for example, there are a lot of explainability frameworks um, available in PyTorch at the moment, which can be, um, as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, also applied to graph neural networks uh, in PyG. Um, because like PyG is, is a PyTorch library, as you said, we can talk about TensorFlow support later. Um, and so it doesn't do any, any magic, right? It's, it's just tensor um, arithmetics. Um, and therefore it also works, like if you have a your general PyTorch library for explainability, PyG works out of the box on that. Um, um, instead of using a CNN, you can now use a GNN and explain predictions such as um, why is that link uh, between two nodes or why is, make, is that node making that prediction? And the, the research regarding explainability in graph neural networks then comes from the fact that um, how can we effectively capture like subgraphs that are important for a given prediction or how can we capture certain links that are um, um, important. And so the main challenge here is that we want to combine graph structure and feature information into, it and into an explainability algorithm. While most other explainability algorithms just care about features and not structure because the structure is fixed and given, right? And so that is the main challenge uh, if you want to apply explainability to graph neural networks. Um, but there are already a lot of them um, proposed in research and some of them are also already integrated in, in GNNs. But I definitely agree that um, we need to extend this functionality. And in particular, that it is really important for, for industry to like confirm that the graph neural network um, that's the correct thing because of the, um, of the, yeah, correct, um, or it, it does the correct thing because it, it is visible in the explainability that this kind of makes sense um, because of that, yeah. Yeah, well, one of the interesting questions then might be that, for example, in image classification data, you know, different layers give you different information like edges um, and, you know, the corners, um, curves. Um, cusps and things like that. So you at ev any every layer point, you can tell, you know, what this is layer doing. And I'm just wondering, how does it actually work in um, GNNs where each layer would, you know, tell you how is that correlated with the other neighbors, you know, how strong was the correlation. And then also there is an added a layer of complexity, which is the message transfer between different nodes and how often that was used, how how is that activated. Just let's get a little bit, um, um, you know, deep into how it works. Inherently, I do understand that, you know, you talked about um, the, these explainability plot frameworks um, at the moment are not inherent in PyG, but comes from the outside that are easily integratable um, with PyG. But, you know, uh, and in, at any point in future, if you were to, you know, inherently put that um, in GNNs, um, how would that look like? Yeah, so first of all, like, we have a few explainability algorithms that are spe uh, specifically designed for graph neural networks integrated in PyG. And the general procedure here is that we um, basically learn an edge mask and a node mask um, to explain the given prediction of a certain node. And so that edge mask and that node mask is soft. And so we can optimize it. We are um, stochastic gradient descent to just maintain um, the edges that don't change the outcome of the prediction. And that give you, gives you basically meaningful, meaningful edges that are like really important for the GNN to make exactly this prediction. And it gives you also the important nodes or the important features to make that prediction. But importantly, um, the node mask and the edge mask need to be trained jointly because like the graph neural network can reason about graph structure and feature information um, simultaneously as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the number data. 80% of the data is a structured Excel or CSV format. Uh, one, how is that going to be um, added to the GNN? Plus, if there's a regression problem where you actually have to predict um, a certain class or binomial logistic regression or things like this, 
how does it actually work uh, with GNNs? And then, you know, their explainability issues, like why is that going to get, why is it giving a prediction that it is? Uh, you mean like um, predicting from certain C CSV files and then making explain uh, explanations on them or how but, do I understand it? Like how do you import the CSV file first into the GNNs and then also um, predicting, let's say sales uh, um, based on um, the previous um, historical data. How would it actually look like? And for example, one if it does predict um, the future in terms of sales, then what is that based on? Like what features were the most important? Yeah, as I said, like you, you first need some kind of feature engineering, of course, um, to um, to convert your CSV files into a numerical representation that can be inputted into a graph neural network, and then this gives you a, a feature vector or multiple features for each column in your in your CSV file, and you can then train your GNN model, for example, like a link prediction um, problem or a no prediction model. You can save your your model, and then um, you can try to explain it. Uh, and the the major thing here is that you now need to um, retransform your given prediction um, to the initially given raw data. And that is kind of I understand that might be kind of um, kind of really complicated um, if you think of like having a text column which contains abstracts of, of, of some descriptions. Um, and if you input that into an, uh, an, 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 an text encoder or a sequence encoder, then you would assume that the explainability part um, predicts the whole feature set as either important for the given task or not. But that is likely not what we will see um, from the explainability model to, to behave. Yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, that, that probably wouldn't be the part um, of it. Um, you know, that, that is really a complicated problem um, in, in many ways. But let's take a um, diversion from that and uh, talk about your other hobbies, like uh, playing bass. Um, are, are you part of a band or how does it work? Yeah, I'm, I'm playing uh, the bass in the band. Uh, it's, it's more of a fan band. Uh, I'm not revealing the name of it because <laughs> I don't want people famous? to find out. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we are just a, a group of, of six people and we all met in school. Um, so that's now about 14 years ago uh, since we started that band. And then we like um, all moved to different locations in Germany and kind of um, don't have the possibility to to train or um, to meet once in a week to um, to become better players. And so um, our motivation just comes from playing at concerts and meeting there and having a good time. And so our 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 feature uh, rep, uh, like our 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 available songs don't get any bigger. And we're just playing the same songs we play now for 14 years. Um, but it works and it makes really fun. It's actually funny uh, that um, there, there's a cover for um, the famous German song um, from Nena, so 99 Schluftballon, which is 99 mm -hmm. um, Red Balloons. Red um, balloons and yes. th there's a cover by Goldfinger where there are different people um, in quarantine um, and, you know, they were playing different parts and then they put that together in a song and, you know, then they had cameras and different people, but then the song was theirs. I was just wondering, you can find out some kind of computer-based solution for your music uh, career as well, if you wanted to. Yeah, I, I think like doing that in, in real time is kind of troublesome because there's always some kind of latency and that makes uh, makes playing together over the internet kind of, yeah, kind of challenging. And how often do you actually meet in concerts? Yeah, uh, last few years, uh, not that much, of course, but we now have our first concert after um, COVID. Uh, in the end of October. So I'm lo really looking forward to that. Nice. You also have this October fest time. Um, are, are you going to the fest? Oh, but, but that's more related to, to Bayern, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but you know anything related to music and, um, you know, festivals? We, 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 we have some, some October fest related events here in Dortmund as well. And where we just drink one liter of beer in a big glass. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, that's uh, I, I don't um, uh, wear anything special in order to attend those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a good news because you know it's the kind of dress. <laughs> It's really weird, uh, but let's get back to um, another aspect of um, how big the Pygia has become. Um, now you've collaborated with Stanford and you're um, running it in um, collaboration and there's other contributors to that also. Um, so the OGB uh, benchmark um, data sets, they're very um, curated um, kind of data sets that can um, give a lot of researchers some kind of um, central uh, repository for um, improving um, the accurate metrics. Um, how did you actually come up with this? You know, how was the collaboration with Stanford um, started? Um, and uh, what are the future directions or the things that you're working on? Yeah, so for, for OGB, that was really interesting. So I was invited one and a half year ago um, to Stanford. Um, which was actually my first research visit outside of Germany. Pretty exciting. Um, and th around that time, there was the idea about the open graph benchmark. It was introduced at NeurIPS um, um, like two months before and al already there um, attracted a lot of attention. And the idea there was that um, currently in graph representation learning, we have some kind of... Um, a problem where we don't have any data sets to work on. And so most research uh, in, in graph representation learning uh, um, evolved around like small scale data sets in which you only have access to 2,000 or 3,000 of nodes. And the problem with these data sets is that you cannot really develop deep and expressive models to operate on these data sets because they just heavily overfit. And as a result, we, we saw a lot of research regarding like um, how can we avoid um, or how can we develop GNNs that avoid overfitting on small scale data. And that is not something that is you often see in deep learning and like um, it kind of contradicts the vision that um, it, CNNs can operate on ImageNet and there are a lot of large scale data sets for text as well, but we didn't at that time have that in, um, in the graph domain. And so the idea was that we want to develop a realistic set of, of benchmark data sets that is also large scale and it is standardized. That means that we have meaningful splits between um, for training validation and testing. And what we find out is that um, most research um, conducted earlier just used random splits. And in some scenarios that makes sense, but in other, it also uh, introduces data leakage. Um, if you think of um, temporal nodes that, um, um, that appear after a given node has actually arrived. Um, and it also provides us with over-optimistic models. And so also the idea here was that we want to provide realistic splittings that make sense from an industry perspective. Like if you think of a citation graph, um, it doesn't make much sense to um, predict the um, citations of a, of a paper that was released in 2012. Uh, but instead you want to have a model that um, gives a user predictions on a new paper he writes or she writes, um, and it should give you give him or her predictions on what he should cite um, for his paper or her paper. And so, in in most of these senses, we opted for a temporal split um, because we felt that makes the most sense, uh, in which we just like um, take all the nodes that arrived in twenty eighteen, use the nodes for in twenty nineteen for validation and then use the remaining one for testing. And what we then find out when we released OGB was that um, it's usually not a good idea to have a public test set um, because um, um, I'm always believing in the best of researchers, but we cannot uh, avoid like um, tuning hyperparameters on the test set really. And it's kind of understandable that people are doing that. Um, and it also contradicts with the vision of how you apply graph neural networks in, in real applications, where you just have validation set and training set, 
and then let your model go and predict on new data coming in. And as a result of that, we tried to prevent that in the OGB LSC, which we um, introduced at KDD Cup 2021, uh, in which we just give the user training and validation set and then have our private hidden test server um, where users just upload their um, test predictions and we evaluate them for them. So it's like a bit of your own Kaggle. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Exactly. I was also looking at uh, some of the leaderboards um, of the data sets um, on OGB. Um, and it's kind of uh, funny that, you know, you were the only participant and also the ranking on MAG 240M, um, the academic um, the data set where you actually have to, you know, predict the, um, let me see, uh, the papers um, and their subjects okay. and their institutions. And it's, it seems to be like you you have the all, all the rankings on this one um, using different methods. Oh, like that's Argan just Argan because Argan. I, uh, sorry, that's just because I did the initial benchmarking. So the leaderboards are up like for one or two weeks now. Uh, and I guess that uh, people haven't started explored them yet. Okay. And it's the same with the other also like Wiki KG90, um, it's Hong Yu Ren and then um, for PCQ, um, why, how, who, um, is, has it been updated or is it like this? Yeah. So like, um, we now provide, um, two different versions of the data set and which we split, um, split to the test, uh, set. So one data set is still used for future competitions. Uh, and one data set, um, can be used to like, um, like to train for yourself and then upload the results to our leaderboard. But we wanted to have that um, distinction between um, making future competitions as well um, and providing the opportunity to for researchers to explore these data sets um, when we are not doing any competitions. And so uh, I think we released the no, new OGB um, version last week. And so the leaderboards are really fresh right now. And I guess we let the community um, take some time to, to upload their results. And, and so, all our, the founder. <laughs> so all our entries are currently by ourselves, by our um, baseline um, results. Okay. Um, looking at the core development team, you certainly have uh, some of the brilliant contributions from outside both um, TU Dortmund and um, Stanford. You have people from um, Harvard and Facebook um, and different other uh, places who have been contributing. You steering committee includes people from um, DeepMind and MIT. And I was just wondering, some of, did some of the data sets come from them also, um, or um, they're just the contributors um, to the library? Uh, you mean in the OGB yes. uh, core team? Okay, yeah. For example, um, um, like most of the other authors um, provided like data sets, and um, I am me and my uh, me and and Wei Ha, we both worked on ba baseline experiments and how to make that OGB package, uh, and so we um, we. Um, have collaborations with Microsoft um, to query the Microsoft Academic Graph really efficiently. Um, and that gave us a lot of data sets in, in, in OGB and archive, OGB and papers 100 million and OGB and Mac and OGB and Mac 240 million. Um, you see a lot of standard is, is around uh, how can we predict paper categories. And then we have uh, Marinka from Harvard who has great knowledge in uh, in all these biological data sets, and she contributed a lot of real world data sets that she thought might be relevant for practical use. Um, and so, yeah, that was like the main idea. You cannot create such a massive data set collection with, with really outstanding collaboration to all kinds of different universities and companies. Yeah, I think, you know, I have a data set um, of for my own psychological um, assessment, psychometric assessment uh, of big five that I've uploaded on Kaggle. It would be a good um, actual exercise to put it out um, for the um, OGB team also to see um, how people are um, able to get a better prediction. But I was just 
wondering why did you choose your own platform instead of Kaggle or some other platform that you could have collaborated with? Oh, that decision is not on me, so I'm not the right person to answer this question. It was just that we would like to have full control over that, I think. Yeah, but don't you, you don't lose control over your data as if that's uploaded on Kaggle. Or, or are you already bitten by the fact that, you know, you were already, already regretting putting out the test and data set earlier that you're talking about? Yeah, to some extent, like, um... At the time, we didn't consider Kaggle as an option, I believe. Um, yeah, but that decision was not on me, so I cannot answer okay. that uh, appropriately. One of the interesting aspects is that um, you know you have um, actually achieved quite an interesting accuracy um, on this um, leaderboard for the um, challenge of Mac 240. And I'm just wondering, have you talked to people at Arvex? Um, are they really using um, that in the production somehow uh, for the search or uh, there, there could be a possible collaboration there? You mean like bringing my models to production or how uh, or they gave me advice how to uh, make m my models better? What no, what I'm saying is that that uh, the model that you have already come up with, um, can they actually put that in production on Arvix so that you know they can make a recommender system for people to be able to find the relevant subjects or the year or right or institutions? I mean, that, that's the basic motivation why we do that, right? We want to see our models in production and to like benef like provide real benefits to, to the world. Um, at even if it's only like, taking some burden from archive moderators <laughs> um but yeah that that would be a dream of course but there are a lot of problems regarding that like um infrastructure um how does that all work um i'm not that experienced in that regard yet but um we should definitely reach out to them and, and see how if if that's really an opportunity and um, if they can imagine incorporating something like that. But we haven't sadly done that yet. Because I think that would be a very good um, start um, for the adoption of um, PyG uh, in um, real life systems. For example, um, we already know that, you know, Netflix is doing a great job with the recommendation systems. Um, and if um, GNN is capable of producing uh, similar results, why shouldn't we actually use an Arvix? And Arvix doesn't honestly have a very good search system. You know, it's a very bland website where you simply have to, you know, put down the number, uh, or the name of the paper, and then it searches for you if it's there or not. Or you can, you know, simply do the simple um, algorithmic search um, there. So that, that would be a um, good idea. Um, for doing this, um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure if, if Archive is interested in in optimizing the search at all. Uh, I feel like they yeah, I feel like there, for example, there exist projects like Archive Sanity, for example, right? Who who try to bring that functionality to to Archive outside of it, um, and so I, I think. Why do I feel like that you already have this conversation with them? <laughs> ah no, <laughs> I didn't. Um, I'm I'm not just sure whether they are really interested in doing that, but it would be great to reach out and, and check. Okay, but what lies for OGB um, in the future? So what what are some of the things that um, you plan to incorporate um, both in um, PyG and 2.0 and, and further, and also from the OGB perspective, are you collecting more data sets? Um, what's in the pipeline? Yeah, for for OGB, I feel like we we have a broad class of of data sets and domains for um, the three main tasks, such as um, graph classification, node level classification, and link prediction. Um, but of course, there are a lot of other different tasks, and uh, we would love to explore those more, such as data sets for graph generation and stuff like that. Um, that's definitely in the pipeline. And what's also in the pipeline is to have some more data sets that really try to bring more real world use cases in the form of temporal graphs in which you have a constant data stream coming in of events arriving. And then you need to make like, um, make predictions um, on these ever changing dynamic graphs rather than just looking at the current timestamp. And I feel like a lot of research regarding GNNs completely forget about temporal graphs. That's kind of sad to see. 
Um, but I feel like for temporal graphs, we are also limited um, to some kind of, or we are limited in that sense that it's really hard to implement temporal graphs and, and working with them. So for example, um, new graphs or new events coming in, you get new edges, new nodes. Um, that is a challenge on, it, on its own to handle. And then you think of like sampling neighborhoods around newly incoming nodes and you only want to um, sample for nodes that are um, whose events are not far away in, 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 in the past. And so I feel like there are a lot of ideas regarding temporal GNNs, but it's really hard and challenging to implement them. And that's why I think uh, we don't see much research evolving around temporal GNNs. Um, but I would love to change that in, in future releases of, of PyG. Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, for me at least, um, based on my experience, what I can see is that it has a very bright future um, if, if you were to take it and expand and if there is proper funding to be able to do the research based on um, GNN um, and using PyG and it might set someday a reach the status of PyTorch or something. Have you also collaborated with some of the brilliant research um, universities around like TU Munich and you have uh, Jürgen Schmidt Hube and quite close to you. Have you at some point, you know, tried to interact with these people reaching out and, you know, making some kind of uh, collaboration to take it to a new level? Um, so yeah, for, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Jürgen Schmidt Hube because um, I have a, a paper with, um, a uh, person from Nathans, which is the startup from, from Jürgen Schmidt Huber. So, um, so that's What's kind of called? a color. Co hmm? The paper, was it called? Oh, it's deep graph matching consensus. Oh, ah, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I tried to collaborate with as much people as I would love to, or I can, but of course, um, my, um, I cannot write a paper every week, so collaborations are, um, um, yeah. yeah. I cannot collaborate with, with any of them, of course. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, since you're um, a postdoctoral student yourself, um, you also have to write your own PhD. So how soon are you, you know, getting done with this and, you know, coming to full time to PyTorch or let's say um, <laughs> the real world, <laughs> as we say in academia? <laughs> Yeah, I'm currently writing my last chapter of my dissertation, um, and that's actually the chapter about PyTorch geometrics. So <laughs> that's really interesting. I will write a lot about the new feature that we brought in in PyG 2.0. Um, so I, I put that chapter to last too, so that I could as, write as much as possible about that, and hopefully I will like um, submit my thesis in around one month or two. And then you can expect me working full time on on PyG, and I'm really curious how that uh, how that goes, and how many features I can I can integrate in as much time as possible. Um, word also has it that while you write your thesis, uh, most people collaborate with people, um, but you share your room with a dog and two rabbits. Um, what's the story behind that? Yes, yeah, that's not a real story. It's just that um, we have two rabbits and a dog and the rabbits lived um, their whole life on our balcony. Um, but one of them got really sick and then we wanted them to have clothes um, to us. And the only room possible for that was my office. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'm sharing a, an office with two rabbits and the dog comes to visit me. Uh, what nearly kind of dog is that? <laughs> it's a it's a chelty i'm not sure if you know it it's kind of a uh, little version of a collie um, okay that's really small from what i know no it's 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 like um it's it's small but it's not so small Okay, but do you think, I think that's a very good strategy. I used to have, um, when I was deep in um, research, I used to have a cat and I think some kind of company really helps take off um, a lot of stress uh, with the research. What has your experience been? 
I, I absolutely love it. Like you can you can look on the right and see the two rabbits. That's that's pretty cool. I'm I'm not sure about cats because I don't like it when when they uh, <laughs> go over my desk and <laughs> um, so I need my desk for working. But I'm I'm open to cats as well. <laughs> I mean, you should try cats sometime also, and they're not as misbehaved as you like to think. <laughs> I mean, you can train them not to, you know, um, hop over your desk, but they are oh, certainly... As, 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 as far as I know, you can't train them, right? <laughs> they are just doing their own thing. Yeah, it, they're not as trainable as dogs, let's put it that way. <laughs> but, you know, you can certainly uh, give them negative reinforcement um, okay. <laughs> for not jumping on your desk and... Um, things like this. But other than that, what what do you actually do to release stress from um, a lot of work? Because I do understand research is a, a very huge undertaking, especially the kind of research that you're doing. Um, so what, if, if someone were to, were to ask you um, how to cope up with the PhD stress, and that's a very common question on Twitter, at least. Um, so what's your way out of that? I mean, like the first way that comes to my mind is doing sports. Um, um, it was troublesome to do that for the last one and a half year because I'm not a kind of person that loves to do sports alone. So I'm not that jogging guy <laughs> uh, who runs around in the park. And I always need some kind of competition to do sports. But uh, yeah, playing soccer um, definitely helps me to release stress. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to not work on weekends and I could... Um, I can re recommend that to everyone to to stay from emails as um, as much as possible. Um, I'm I'm trying to do that, but it's hard. And yeah, just having like fixed fixed work office times also helps. Like um, close your notebook at six p.m. or something like that. Uh, but I guess everyone has to decide on their own. And yes. Um... Matthias, it was uh, such a ball talking to you uh, about so many topics uh, related to PyG, graphical neural networks, um, your hobbies. Um, I really wish you well with your um, development in future for um, PyG and your collaboration uh, with Stanford. It certainly holds a lot of promise, um, at least uh, from what I see. Um, and hopefully you're going to be able to take that to the, uh, the new level. Yeah, thank you very much. It was such a pleasure pleasure to be here, and I I hope I did I did not so bad <laughs> in my first podcast. And not at I'm, all. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing it once again. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>